Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody, to another chapter of A Court of Wings and Ruin, written by Sarah J. Moss, read by yours truly, Freewata, with the explanation point for the added emphasis. Last time we read, oh man, Feyre, Fyra, our homegirl. She got she got blasted by magic. She could have easily protected herself through the wrath of Tamlin. She could have just slapped him, but she chose no. Let it let it show. Let his hostility show. Let his leadership failure show that he is a hibern slave through and through. I don't know, man, but it looks like she, from this last chapter, basically she's trying to get everyone on her side. So let's try to figure out what happens in chapter 9. Ianthe wasn't done. I knew it. Braced myself for it. She didn't flit back to her temple a few miles away. Rather, she remained at the house, seizing her chance to worm her way closer to Tamlin. She believed she'd gained a foothold, that her declaration of justice served at the bloody end of the whipping hadn't been anything but a final slap in the face to the guards who watched. And when that sentry had sagged back from his bindings, when the others came to gently untie him, Yante merely ushered the Highburn party and Tamlin into the manor for lunch. But I'd remained at the barracks, tending to the groaning sentry, drawing away bloodied bowls of water while the healer quietly patched him up. Braun and Hart personally escorted me back to the estate hours later. I thanked them each by name. Then apologized that I hadn't been able to prevent it. Iante scheming, or the unjust punishment of their friend. I meant every word. The crack of the whip still echoing in my ear. Then they spoke the words I'd been waiting for. They were sorry. They hadn't stopped any of it, either. Not just today, but the bruises now fading, at last, the other incidents. If I had asked them, they would have handed me their own knives to slit their throats. The next evening, I was hurrying back to my room to change for dinner when Iante made her next move. She was to come with us to the wall tomorrow morning, her and Tamlin, too. If we were all to be a united front, she declared over dinner, then she wished to see the wall herself. The Highburn Royals didn't care, but Jirian winked at me, as if he, too, saw the game in motion. I packed my own bags that night. Alice entered right before bed, a third pack in her hands. Since it's a longer trip, I brought you supplies. Even with Tamlin joining us, it was too many people for him to winnow us directly. So we'd go as we'd gone before in segments, a few miles at a time. Alice laid the pack she prepared beside my own, picked up the brush on the vanity and beckoned me to sit on the cushioned bench before it. I obeyed. For a few minutes, she brushed my hair in silence. Then she said, When you leave tomorrow, I'll leave too. I lifted my eyes to hers in the mirror. My nephews are packed. The pony is ready to take us back to the summer court territory at last. It has been too long since I saw my home, she said, though her eyes shone. I know the feeling was all I said. I wish you well, lady, Alice said, setting down the brush and beginning to braid back my hair. For the rest of your days, however long they may be, I wish you well. I let her finish the plate and pivoted on the bench to grip her thin fingers of mine. Don't ever tell Tarkin you knew me well. Her brows rose. There's a blood ruby with my name on it, I clarified. Even her tree bark skin seemed to blanch. She understood it well enough. I was a hunted enemy of the Summer Corp. Only my death would be accepted as payment for my crimes. Alice squeezed my hand. Blood rubies or no, you will always have one friend in the summer court. My throat bobbed, and 
You will always have one in mind. I promised her. She knew which chord I meant and did not look afraid. The sentries did not glance at Tamlin, or so much as speak to him unless absolutely necessary. Braun, Hart, and three others were to join us. They had spotted me checking on their friend before dawn, a courtesy I knew none of the others had extended. Winnowing felt like wading through mud. In fact, my powers had become more of a burden than a help. I had a throbbing headache by noon, and spent the last leg of my journey dizzy, disoriented as we winnowed again and again. We arrived and set up camp in near silence. I quietly, shyly, asked to share a tent with Yante instead of Tamlin, appearing eager to mend the rift the whipping had torn between us. But I did it more to spare Lucian from her attention than to keep Tamlin at bay. Dinner was made and eaten, bed rolls laid out, and Tamlin ordered Braun and Hart on the first watch. Lying beside Iante without slitting her throat was an exercise in patience and control. But whenever the knife beneath my pillow seemed to whisper her name, I'd remind myself, my friends, the family that was alive, healing in the north. I repeated their names silently over and over into the darkness. Bryson, Moore, Cassie, and Amran, Azriel, Elaine, Esta. I thought of how I'd last seen them, so bloodied and hurting. Thought of Cassian's scream as his wings were shredded. Of Azrael's threat to the king as he advanced on Moor. Nesta, fighting every step toward the cauldron. My goal was bigger than revenge. My purpose greater than personal retribution. Dawn broke, and I found my palm curled around the hilt of my knife anyway. I drew it up as I sat up, staring down at the sleeping priestess. The smooth column of her neck seemed to glow in the early morning, leaking through the tent flaps. I weighed the knife in my hand. I wasn't sure I'd been born with the ability to forgive, not for terrors inflicted on those I loved. For myself, I didn't care, not nearly as much. But there was some fundamental pillar of steel in me that could not bend or break in this. Could not stomach the idea of letting these people get away with what they'd done. Yante's eyes opened. The teal as limpid as her discarded circlet. They went right to the knife in my hand, then to my face. You can't be too careful while sharing a camp with enemies, I said. I could have sworn something like fear shone in her eyes. I burn is not our enemy, she said a tad breathlessly. From her paleness, as I left the tent, I knew my answering smile had done its job well. Lucian and Tamlin showed the twins where the crack in the wall lay, and as they had done with the first two, they spent hours surveying it, the surrounding land. I kept close this time, watching them, my presence now deemed relatively unthreatening, not a nuisance. We played our little power games, established I could buy it if I wished, but we'd tolerate each other. Here, Branagh murmured to Dagden, jerking her chin to the invisible divider. The only markings were the different trees on our side. They were bright, fresh green on spring. On the other, they were dark, broad, curling slightly with heat, the height of summer. First one's better, Dagden countered. I sat atop a small boulder, peeling an apple with a paring knife. Closer to the western coast, too, he added to his twin. This is closer to the continent, to the strait. I sliced deep into the flesh of the apple, carving out the hunk of white meat. Yes, but we'd have more access to the High Lord's supplies. Said High Lord was currently off with Jurian hunting for food more filling than the sandwiches we'd packed. Iante had gone to a nearby spring to pray, and I had no idea whatsoever where Lucian or the sentries were. Good. Easier for me as I shoved the apple slice in my mouth and I sat around it. I say go for this one. They twisted toward me, Branagh sneering and Dagden's brows high. What do you know of any of it? 
Branagh demanded. I shrugged, cutting another piece of apple. You two talk louder than you realize. Shared accusatory glances between them. Proud, arrogant, cruel. I'd been taking their measure this fortnight. Unless you want to risk the other courts having time to rally and intercepting you before you can cross to the straight, I'd pick this one. Branagh rolled her eyes. I went on, rambling and bored. But what do I know? You two have squatted on a little island for 500 years. Clearly you know more about Prithian and moving armies than me. Branagh hissed. This is not about armies, so I will trust you to keep that mouth shut till we have use for you. I snorted. You mean to tell me all of this nonsense hasn't been to find a place to break through the wall and use the cauldron to also transport the mass of your armies here? She laughed, swinging her dark curtain of hair over a shoulder. The cauldron is not for transporting grunt armies. It is for remaking worlds. It is for bringing down this hideous wall and reclaiming what we were. I merely crossed my legs. I'd think that with an army of 10,000, you wouldn't need any magical objects to do your dirty work. Our army is 10 times that girl, Brennick sneered, and twice that number if you count our allies in Valahan, Montesser, and Rask. 200,000. Mother save us. You've certainly been busy all these years, I surveyed them. Utterly nonplussed. Why not strike when Amarantha had the island? The king had not yet found the cauldron, despite years of searching. It served his purposes to let her be an experiment for how we might break these people, and served as good motivation for our allies on the continent to join us, knowing what could await them. I finished off my apple and chucked the core into the woods. They watched it fly like two hounds tracking a pheasant. So they're all going to converge here. I'm supposed to play hostess to so many soldiers? Our own force will take care of Prithian before uniting with the others. Our commanders are preparing for it as we speak. You must think you stand a shot at losing if you're bothering to use the cauldron to help you win. The cauldron is victory. It will wipe this world clean again. I lifted my brows in irreverent cynicism. And you need this exact spot to unleash it? This exact spot, Danik Dagden said, a hand on the hilt of his sword, exists because a person or object of mighty power passed through it. The cauldron will study the work they've already done, magnify it, until the wall collapses entirely. It is a careful, complex process, and one I doubt your mortal mind grasp. Probably, though this mortal mind did manage to solve Amarantha's riddle and destroy her. Branagh merely turned back to the wall. Why do you think Highburn let her live for so long in these lands? Better to have someone else do his dirty work. I had just what I needed. Tamlin and Jurian were still off hunting. The royals were preoccupied, and I sent the sentries to fetch me more water claiming that some of my bruises still ached and I wanted to make a poultice for them. They looked positively murderous at that. Not at me, but at who had given me those bruises. Who had picked Iante over them, and Highburn over their honor and people. I'd brought three packs, but I'd only need one. This one I'd carefully repacked with Alice's new supplies now tucked beside everything I'd anticipated needing to get clear of them and go. The one I'd brought with me on every trip out to the wall, just in case. And now? I had numbers. I had a purpose. I had a specific location. And I had names of foreign territories. But more than that, I had a people who had lost their faith in their high priestess. I had centuries who were beginning to rebel against their high lord. And as a result of those things... I had Highburn royals doubting the strength of their allies here. I'd primed this court to fall. <clears throat> Not from outside forces, but its an own internal warring. And I had to be clear of that before it happened, before the last silver of my plan fell into place. The party would return without me. And to maintain that illusion of strength, Tamlin and Iante would lie about it, 
where I'd gone. And perhaps a day or two after that, one of these sentries would reveal the news, a carefully sprung trap that I'd coiled into his mind like one of my snares. I'd fled for my life. After being nearly killed by the hybrid prince and princess, I'd planted images in his head of my brutalized body. The markings, consistent with what Dagden and Branagh had already revealed to be their style, he'd describe them in detail. Describe how he helped me get away before it was too late. How I ran for my life when Tamlin and Iante refused to intervene to risk their alliance with Highburn. And when the sentry revealed the truth, no longer able to stomach keeping quiet when he saw how my sorry fate was concealed by Tamlin and Iante, just as Tamlin had sided with Iante the day he flogged that sentry. When he described what Highburn had done to me, their curse breaker, their newly anointed cauldron blessed, before I had fled for my life. There would be no further alliance, for there would be no sentry or denizen of this court who would stand with Tamlin or Yante after this. After me. I ducked into my tent to grab my pack, my steps light and swift, listening, barely breathing. I scanned the camp, the woods. A few seconds extra had me snatching Tamlin's bandolier of knives from where he'd left them inside his tent. They'd get in the way while using a bow and arrow, he explained that morning. Their weight was considerable, as I slung it across my chest, the Lyrian fighting knives. Home. I was going home. I didn't bother to look back at that camp as I slipped into the northern tree line. If I winnowed without stopping between leaps, I'd be at the foothills in an hour, and would vanish through one of the caves not long after that. I made it about a hundred yards into the cover of the trees before I halted. I heard Lucian first. Back off, a low female laugh. Everything in me went still and cold at the sound I'd once heard in Ryson's memory. Keep going. They were distracted, horrible as it was. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I thought you'd seek me out after the right, Yante purred. They couldn't be more than 30 feet through the trees, far enough away not to hear my presence. I was quiet enough. I was obligated to perform the rite, Lucian snapped. That night wasn't the product of desire. Believe me. We had fun, you know, you and I. I'm a mated male now. Every second was the ringing of my death knell. I would primed everything to fall. I would long since stopped feeling any sort of guilt or doubt about my plan. Not with Alice now safely away. And yet. And yet. You don't act like that way with Fyra. A silk wrap threat. You're mistaken. Am I? Twigs and leaves crunched, as if she was circling him. You put your hands all over her. I had done my job too well. Provoked her jealousy too much with every instance I'd found ways to get Lucian to touch me in her presence. In Tamlin's presence. Do not touch me, he growled. And then I was moving. I masked the sound of my footfalls, silent as a panther as I stalked the little clearing where they stood. Where Lucian stood. Back against a tree, twin bands of blue stone shackled around his wrists. I'd seen them before. On rise to immobilize his power. Stone hewn from Hybron's rotted land capable of nullifying magic, and in this case, holding Lucian against that tree as Iante surveyed him like a snake before a meal. She slid a hand over the broad panes of his chest, his stomach, and Lucian's eyes shot to me as I stepped between the trees, fear and humiliation reddening his golden skin. That's enough, I said. Iante whipped her head to me. Her smile was innocent, simpering. But I saw her note the pack. Tamlin's bandolier. Dismissed them. We were in the middle of a game, weren't we, Lucian? He didn't answer. And the sight of those shackles on him. However, she had trapped him. The sight of her hand still on his stomach. We'll return to the camp when we're done. She said, turning to him again. Her hand slid lower. Not for his own pleasure was simply to throw it in my face that she could. I struck. Not with my knives or magic. 
but my mind. I ripped down the shield I'd kept up around her to avoid the twins' control and slammed myself into her consciousness. The mask over a face of decay. That's what it was like to go inside that beautiful head and find such hideous thoughts inside of it. A trail of mail she'd used her power on to outright force to bed, convinced of her entitlement to them. I'd pulled back against the tug of those memories, mastering myself. Take your hands off him. She did. Unshackle him. Lucian's skin drained of color as Yonthe obeyed me, her face queerly vacant, pliant. The blue stone shackles thumped to the mossy ground. Lucian's shirt was askew, the top button on his pants already undone. The roaring that filled my mind was so loud that I could barely hear myself as I said, Pick up that rock. Lucian remained pressed against that tree, and he watched in silence as Ionthe stooped to pick up a gray rough, rough rock about the size of an apple. Put your right hand to that boulder. She obeyed through a tremor, went, though a tremor went down her spine. Her mind thrashed and struggled against me like a fish snared on a line. I dug my mental talons in deeper and some inner voice of hers began screaming. Smash your hand with the rock as hard as you can until I tell you to stop. The hand she'd put on him, on so many others. Ionthe brought the stone up. The first impact was muffled, wet thud. The second was an actual crack. The third drew blood. Her arm rose and fell, her body shuddering with agony. And I said to her very clearly, You will never touch another person against their will. You will never convince yourself that they truly want your advances that they're playing games. You will never know another's touch unless they initiate, unless it's desired by both sides. Whack, crack, thud. You will not remember what happened here, and you will tell the others that you fell. Her ring finger had shifted in the wrong direction. You are allowed to see a healer to set the bones, but not to erase the scarring. And every time you look at that hand, you're going to remember that touching people against their will has consequences. If you do it again, everything you are will cease to exist. You will live with that terror every day and never know where it originates. Only the fear of something chasing you, hunting you, waiting for you the instant you let your guard down. Silent tears of pain flowed down her face. You can stop now. The bloodied rock tumbled onto the grass. Her hand was little more than cracked bones wrapped in shredded skin. Kneel here until someone finds you. Ionthe fell to her knees, her ruined hand leaking blood onto her pale robes. I debated slitting your throat this morning, I told her. I debated it all last night while you slept beside me. I've deba debated it every single day since I learned you sold out my sisters to Highburn. I smiled a bit. But I think this is better punishment. And I hope you live a long, long life, Ionthe and never know a moment's peace. I stared down at her for a moment longer, trying off the tapestry, tying off the tapestry of words and commands I'd woven into her mind, and turned to Lucian. He'd fixed his pants, his shirt, his wide eyes slid from her to me, then to the bloodied stone. The word you're looking for, Lucian, crooned a deceptively light female voice, is Damati. We whirled toward Branagh and Dagden as they stepped into the clearing, grinning like wolves. That, my friends, was the end of Chapter 9. We're almost to the double digits. Holy moly. Branagh and Dagden coming in right at the end. We were trying to dip out. Maybe they were trying to stalk Fyra after that? Trying to stalk Fyra, our, our little homegirl? Maybe they do. Maybe they knew, maybe they're a little bit stronger than we had thought originally that they uh, made it through her little guys without her really without Pharaoh really knowing and now maybe that their plan is playing out I don't know maybe they've given fake information now cuz I mean it seems like they were overplaying a lot of that right 200,000 troops of fay you know, they make it seem like there's not that many Fey in the world really at all. 
especially like militia like warlike fae but other than that let's get, let's get ready to get back into chapter 10 y'all so make sure to stay hydrated stay beautiful stay hydrated and we will see you in the next chapter